and everyone will get a little note asking that they're okay with that. Um, so, hi, uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where in the world you are. Um, you are really very, very welcome to the um, BAPT 2022 keynote speech that is being given to us by David Hodgson. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome David uh, to the session. Um, David is somebody who um, is a training consultant and author, quite a prolific author. Mostly his work is with teenagers, teachers and career advisors in schools and universities across the UK and also more broadly globally with, uh, with the new role um, that, uh, that David has. So David uses his own version of personality type, The Buzz, which is a book I would recommend if anyone hasn't got it, I'd recommend you did, uh, to help inspire children to make more informed decisions about their future. Um, but this session is post-traumatic growth pointing in a positive direction. So I'm delighted to welcome you, David, and over to you. Okay, thank you, Sarah, and good evening or good morning, et cetera, to everyone. It's really good to um, have a, a, a nice audience, and I hope we're going to have a session tonight that's going to be of interest to you, and, and uh, we'll have a, hopefully have a bit of fun. There's a chance to contribute and share your thoughts and ideas too. And I'm going to start by sharing with you one of my favourite proverbs. It's an African one. When the music changes, so does the dance. And I think I've always thought this sums up what we do with personality type quite so well. And it's ever more relevant at the moment when the music has certainly changed in the last couple of years. So that's what I'd like you to keep in mind as we go through. And the, the thing I'm going to hand the session around this evening is post-traumatic growth. I'll explain a little bit about that as we go through. It's a very serious topic, but um, I'm going to use, uh, hopefully have a bit of fun with it too. Um, but it, I do accept it's a very serious topic, uh, but we're going to enjoy ourselves, I hope, tonight. Um, okay, so when the music changes, so does the dance. And post-traumatic growth is an example of this. It's, a, it's about recognizing when the music changes and then doing something about it. And I think that is at the core of personality type theory. So we've got the quote there from Isabel Briggs Myers, uh, which, which says the same. What, what comes in, what goes out, that's what, what this is all about and how can we help people as they experience this. For a starter, what I'd like to do is just to, uh, ask you this question. Who do you think reports higher levels of happiness 12 months after this huge life-changing event? People who've won what, more than one million pounds on the lottery, or people who've been seriously injured following um, an accident. So I would just like you to ponder that. And if you wanted to put your thoughts in the chat, then that's absolutely fine. We will be returning to this theme um, as we go through. Okay. Just gonna have a little look at the um, yeah. So I think everyone knows this that the the answer is B. So we're gonna. And this is an example of post traumatic growth. It's an example of something uh, incredibly important happening to us that's life changing, and then so the music changes, and then we 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 then make big changes in our lives. So this is the 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 core theme of what we're talking about. And my work has mostly been as a careers advisor, a careers coach, uh, and uh, it's it's meeting people when they've had something, when they're at a big crossroads in their life, and then what do we do with them um, to support. To introduce the item, I wanted to share three quick examples, three stories. One of them is from Elizabeth Loftus, a professor of psychology and law. She's quite controversial. She, the, her theme is words are important and she thinks no one can really get a fair trial because how the words are, are, are used and presented by 
people defending or prosecuting is, go is going to influence the proceedings. For some of her research, one thing she did was she showed people a clip of uh, uh, two cars colliding and she asked the first group of people, at what speed do you think the cars were traveling when they hit each other? And the, uh, the uh, answer on average was 34 miles per hour. She then showed the same clip to another group of people and, and asked, at what speed were the cars traveling when they smashed into each other? She just changed one word and the, on average, it went up to 41 miles per hour. So the, the words that we use have an impact. Another example of her research, and I want you to think about that as in the work that we do, the words we use with our clients, with the people we work with, are important. And I think the words that we have available to us as type practitioners, when we share someone's personality profile, are magical, they're powerful. And we need to remember that, how powerful these words are. Another example of, of some research she did was she asked some surgeons, um, she said, if, we, if I was gonna offer you a new treatment for a, 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 a terminal illness, sorry, not a terminal Ill illness, uh, if I was to offer you a new treatment, um, she asked, would you, would you, would you um, would you use it? And she said to some of them, the, the patient will have a 90% chance of survival. And to the other group, she said, the patients will have a 10% chance of dying. Um, and there was a big difference in the number of surgeons that said they would, would take up her offer of this treatment. Uh, and it would be the, the, the first group. Um, so I want us to remember this as I go through, because I think this is part of um, how we can use the idea of post-traumatic growth in our work to make a, a, a more positive impact. One example I had in my own work was I, I did some work with some teachers and one teacher was from Pakistan and we were talking about this very thing, the power of words and how it can shape beliefs. And the, the following year she came back to the conference and she said she told her children that she taught that children with blue eyes struggle with maths and children with brown eyes tend to do very well. And she must have seen my face as she told me this, because I thought, this doesn't, I'm not sure about the morals of this. And then she said, oh, don't worry, it doesn't, it, it's fine. There are no children with blue eyes in my class, so, so it's fine. And I thought, I'm still not sure about the morals of that. But she reported that the all of the children that year did did much better in maths than in the previous years she taught. So it does the, the, the power of words. That's one one key idea. Another key idea comes from the example of George Danzig. And I don't know if anyone's familiar, familiar with him, but he is someone who, as a student, an undergraduate, he would turn up to lectures late. And he, would, uh, he turned up to one lecture so late that uh, he had gone. And he recognised the professor's handwriting on the board and thought, right, well, there's three questions down there. It must be the homework. I'll copy those down and go and apologise to the lecturer, the professor, later on in the week. And he went to see the uh, professor later in the week and said, I'm sorry I missed the lecture, but I did copy down the homework and I've managed to solve two of the equations that were, were on the board. And the professor looked at him and said, but th th there wasn't any homework, but those equations on the board, well, that wasn't homework. Those were two of the three unsolved equations of statistics. And he said, oh, really? I think I've solved two of them. And he showed the professor his work and he actually had solved two of these equations that had baffled the best brains for a number of years. And what was interesting was when he was asked afterwards, would you have been able to solve those if you knew what they were? And he said, of course not. I just would not have believed I could possibly have solved those. He did go on to have quite a, a good career, George Danzig, as well, in statistics. But there are so many examples of uh, people, the, the idea that if we believe something to be true, if we, whether it's believing in ourselves or believing in other things, then it does matter. It's going to have an impact on the results. And I have certainly noticed this in the clients that I work with and, and want to use this to not just for my advantage, but for their advantage. The third 
I like to, to you to keep in mind that underpins what I'm going to talk about is the idea of uh, brain plasticity. When you ask neuroscientists, what's the bit, what's the big news about? What's the important news about neuroscience? What is it that we should know about? And they generally do say plasticity is the big big idea, the idea that our brains continually change and grow. Um, so the old idea that perhaps in the past that uh, so no, one of the founders of psychology, Cyril Bird, he thought intelligence was fixed at the age of 10. And that's why they then set up the education system in Britain to, to have an 11 plus and to have secondary school starting at 11, because by then children were, were, you knew how clever they were. So that idea, and that permeates education systems across most of the world, unfortunately. And this is a false idea. So intelligence is not fixed. It's something that we can redevelop throughout our life. We can change, we can change who we are, we can change our beliefs through, and change skills and knowledge, certainly. Okay, so those are the, some of the ideas that underpin what I'm going to talk about next. And I wanted to start off with something about beliefs. So let's have a little look at beliefs. Um, one example of belief, a belief would be our pan, if I were to ask, are pandas real? Most, I'm sure you ha you'll have an answer to this. Um, most, I would guess, most of you will think pandas are real. And if we think, well, how do we come to that belief? How do we have that solid belief that pandas are real? And we'll, we, can, we can look, we look for evidence. So some of the pros would be David Attenborough talks about them. So we, it must be true. Um, they're, 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 they are the logo on the uh, WWW. Uh, you can see them not just at Edinburgh Zoo, Zoo, but at a few zoos and they're very cute. So that, that would be against uh, my my argument against would be they just they really do look like people in costume to me they look uh, and they have implausible lifestyles because they only eat bamboo and they're not really fond of um, sex at all um, and you don't really do we ever get to see them close up so we could you could it could be an argument against now hopefully this is a fun example but this, this goes for anything we believe. We have to, one way of forming a belief is that we, we do a for and against. And we, we see this a lot with it within the type community. We get criticized that there are the things for and against type as a model. There are th things for and against all sorts of things that we might believe in. Uh, so some of our beliefs are formed in this way. It's we accumulate evidence and we make a rational decision. What's more interesting is if we start to look at how the majority of beliefs are formed, not in that way, it's something different happens. So if I were to ask you the question, have you ever thought of murdering your partner? And I think I did ask Sarah earlier on whether, whether I don't know whether you're prepared to share your answer as we're being recorded here, Sarah. <laughs> Yes, I have. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So the, I think this is an ex-partner now, now lives in a different country to you, don't they? So I think he's the, he's safe. Um, uh, th this is a, a, some the comedian Robin Inns. He asks, asks this question of his audiences. Um, and he says, mostly people, there's nervous laughter, but people will not raise their hands to say that they have thought, thought about this. He said, oh, but, uh, only on one occasion did someone raise their hand, and it was a, a gentleman who said he had thought about murdering his partner, and the seat next to him was empty, and his, his partner hadn't turned up that evening, he, he said. And then partway through the gig, the, a woman walked down the aisle and sat next to him, and it was his partner. He said the whole audience was just laughing and uh, just, uh, he didn't have to say anything. The audience were in hysterics. Um, so mostly we wouldn't admit to this kind of thing. And then he, he also asked other questions. I don't know if you've ever had the thought when you're at a, a busy tube and you think, I could push that person in front of me, in front of the tube, and they would die. I, I, um, or if we've got a, a child at the top of the stairs and we think, if I, I, if I drop this baby, 
it, it, there could be terrible consequences. And, and what these kinds of examples show is it's something to do with how our brain works. It's the negativity bias. And it's also, and it's basically our brain warning us um, of all the dire consequences. What's the worst thing that could happen? We need to know that so we can avoid it happening. Um, so this is part of how our brain works. And this is something that the clients we work with, um, this is what their, their natural experience will be. There'll be a lot of negativity uh, bias going on. And I think that's one of the things the type really is very useful to, to sweep away a lot of that and allow us to, to ask different questions. Okay, I just thought as we're a type community, I thought I would I'd, I'd try to come up with a, my idea of who would make the best murderer uh, based on personality type. So this is why Sarah has asked you to put your letters uh, up on the screen. So I don't know whether you would agree with, with my suggestion to, to uh, but I think the perfect killers would probably be ISFJ. They're, they're so lovely, people wouldn't suspect them and they and they pay attention to all the details. And I'm, I'm speaking to someone who has a, a daughter who's a ISFJ, so I do need to be extra careful around her. Um, okay, luckily my wife's uh, ASFJ, so she's too busy socialising and looking after everybody, so every you know her all her friends and so on. So she too wouldn't have time to kill me. I fingers crossed. Okay. Let's have a look. So a lot of beliefs aren't that, that formed rationally. They're, they're beliefs that are formed quite quickly. We were trained to be able to help people overcome phobias a few years ago, about 12, 15 years ago. And it was fascinating to work with individuals that had phobias and they needed to get rid of them. Um, the most common one is fear of flying, so I did help a number of people with that. There were some quite bizarre ones, there were, well, uh, the balloon one, um, someone who was scared of balloons, and she, and she wanted to, to, me to help her because she, she wasn't able to go to her grandchild's birthday parties. She'd missed them all because the, just the thought that there might be some balloons. Um, and. So I was able to help with that. And the, the way she uh, got her belief that uh, her phobia of balloons, and this was actually true, a lot of phobias are caused by older brothers. A lot of people seem that phobias are caused by having an older brother. Um, and this, this woman, when she was young, she was at the beach and um, there were some ships out at sea and there were fire and guns. And they were very loud and she was so upset by this and she hid under the, under the bench. Um, and then her brother had a balloon and he put it quite close to it and popped it. And since then she had, she's, the, the, her fear of balloons is real to her. And it stopped her, you know, seeing her grand, grandchild at birthday parties. And there are lots of examples of, of these kinds of bobbies. So they're real. And a lot of beliefs that our, the people we work with and the people we're trying to help will have been formed in this kind of way. Um, and most phobias are formed in one experience, one go. It's not something that we think rationally about. Um, and this is to do with um, sensory overload. Um, we are overwhelmed by an experience and then we have a belief that we will stick with. And for most people, this is beliefs that are uh, such as a phobia, that's something negative. And five years ago or so, I, I, I found some work from palliative care workers. And so I want to ask you to, to have a think on this one. These are the palliative care workers noticed that people seem to have the same regrets in the final months of their lives. The same regrets seem to come up over and over again. And these were the top five. 
So I'd just like you to maybe look at these and think which, which if any of these apply to you now, today, this evening. Which of these are relevant to you in your life? Which of, the, which of these are things that you think you should, uh, you, you would agree with? And just before I ask for anyone to join in, I would say that all of those apply to me, um, possibly apart from the one I've um, highlighted in purple. Because uh, spending, I wish I'd spent more time with, with family for me, that would have to depend on which family members I'm talking about, I think. Um, I think one or two of them, I've probably spent, I do spend enough time with them and I'm sure they'd agree um, in, the, in the other direction. But all the rest, uh, absolutely. So it would be nice to maybe open it up and see if anyone would like to um, comment on how they, if any of these are real to them. I'm just going to have a little quick look down some comments as well. Okay. Just to say there's a really interesting book at the moment by Daniel Pink called The Power of Regret, in which he analyzes four types of regret as being uh, regrets about not doing the foundational work, not, uh, not being bold enough, uh, doing something ethically wrong, uh, or not being connected enough. And so that uh, people's regrets seem to fall into those large categories yeah okay and I, yeah thank you for that jerry and, I, and I'm, I'm sure there are lots of different ways we can describe this the the, the palliative care workers I, I i found that resonated with me that was i found that work and then started to use it with clients share it with with uh with people to see what impact it would have on them okay Right, what I'd like to do now. Okay, so we're, we're gonna now have a look at the post-traumatic growth. This slide uh, of, uh, of, of chat with, with people. Um, just to introduce that, as a careers advisor, I would find that, so, I mean, quite often people would come into the interview and they just would say they wanted their CV, their CV checked over. And sometimes I just thought, oh, I'm going to get, get stuck into some in-depth careers guidance here. They, let's, let's look at their life. And, uh, uh, you know, and we'd go, we'd go into much more depth. Um, some of the most interesting people that would come in, and this is where I, this predated me finding out about post-traumatic growth and reading about, about this as a thing. Uh, and I'd noticed that a lot of people would come in, the, the most committed to, to, to change, were people that would say things like, my wife has recently died or my parents died and I now want to make a big change in my life. I'm now ready to. Or they'd say, what one um, person, I, 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 you know, I recently had a child and I want them to grow up to be proud of me and the, the job I currently do. I'm not proud of myself. I don't think I'm making the most of my potential. So I want to make a change so that my you know, child or grandchild can look up to me. So the, these were usually the people that were the most strongly motivated to make a change. And, and when I would meet them later, they're the ones that did make a change. They weren't the ones that would procrastinate. So I'd noticed this in the work that I was doing, that, that, that there was, it, it, it's, it's in effect, this post-traumatic growth. So then when I found out about post-traumatic growth and started to look at the, the, there are five big changes that people make. So what often happens if something traumatic happens to us, if we have a big event, it could cause a phobia or it could cause post-traumatic stress. And that's the most common outcome. But for some people, it doesn't. For some people, it's, it, it, the, the, these five things happen to them. They, they, they experience this difficulty and they react in one of these or more than one of these five ways. So I would like you to have a look at these five things and to think about um, possibly personally, um, how personality type 
being aware of the model and being able to use it on self as well as others, how that is a way that it not only changes the music, it, it gives us the motivation to actually change the dance, to change the response to it. And when I focus on these five questions, these are the ones that I often ask people I work with. Um, so I, I'm happy to ask, who, who are you? Really, who are you? Um, uh, what are your priorities? What, what is the meaning and purpose? Um, and when we ask these questions, I find that, I mean, these are challenging questions to ask someone, but I think these are the important questions. These are the ultimate questions. These are the ones that are gonna help someone get to, to make real change. And I find that personality type allows us to not just ask the question, but then to, to, to have tools and frames that allow us to then start to explore the, the, uh, and help the client answer these big questions. So I've put in brackets some examples of the ways in which I use type around some of these questions. So I thought it would be quite, quite useful for, if, if anyone can link some of the work that they do perhaps to, to some of these questions and, sh and share with the group. I can't see everybody. Uh, I don't know if you can see everyone's um, screen, Sarah, if, if anyone's sharing any. So Catherine's raised her hand. So thank you, Catherine. Well, I'm thinking about number five and it was really helpful when I started to understand type dynamics because of the ways in which someone's superior dominant leading function influences what they want or need. And I'm thinking about my mom who has ENFP preferences. And when I figured out that I needed to give her a way to be able to pay attention to all of the exciting stimuli in the environment. At the same time, she was trying to pay attention to me that things would work better. So I figured if she could sit when we were together facing something interesting to look at, she didn't have the sort of fear of missing out that would distract her. Whereas if I was facing all the interesting things, she'd be just trying to figure that out and a little less of her attention was on me. So by using type, I was able to understand her a little bit better and our relationship was a little bit closer because we were both able to attend to that moment together. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Catherine. Um, I mean, that, that's something that I experience uh, uh, when I deliver training around personality type, that the thing that adult, adults tend to pick up on is the relationship with, part, with partner or with parents, and they start to uh, look at that again. And um, the, the Just Your Type book is usually the one that people go most to that, it, that I have all of the you know all of my type books out for people to have a look at and they go to that one and look at the relationship that they have with their partner and usually um, find it very accurate and and useful now I certainly remember my, for myself that that was an absolute joy to be able to read uh, to, 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 to get to uh, that self-awareness and the awareness of how I, how I could possibly improve the relationship I had with my wife uh, through the type lens. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, I also find that uh, working a lot with teenagers that they they find it very useful as a way to under, understand their parent when I ask them to work out their parents um, and, and then explore their relationship and one qu quick example is that I ask young people 
if they think about when we're, when we're talking about the F and T preference, the um, to think about what what is that? Do they have two parents? One of what if they have two parents? They have one of each, and if they do, sort of I could say I guess I bet you I know which parent you go to if you've done something wrong. You'll probably go to the F preference parent, yeah, because you're going to get you might get away with it, um, and then they usually laugh, you know, laugh and. The, if, if I ask, is there anyone with two T preference parents, then and they put their hands up and then they, they agree that yes, they, they are brought up more strictly, uh, get away with far less than their friends and so on. So um, the, the, the being able to understand friends and family better, it's incredibly powerful. Okay, I wonder if there's anyone uh, like to, comment on any of the others or maybe something um, that I haven't put in brackets that they find very useful to help with these big questions. So Carol's got a hand up, so Carol. Um, I'm not sure if this is what you're asking, <laughs> but uh, I, my um, students, when I introduce them to type and teach them what it is, they all, I think, feel number three, um, maybe the most, that it sort of lifts the lid off of them. And so this, I'm not afraid to do what makes me happy now, is very um, evident. Uh, a lot of my students are, are psychologists and psychotherapists. And so very often people go into that field because there've been some traumatic childhood experiences. And quite often their type was suppressed somehow, either their dominant or their inferior function, there was some sort of a type distortion. So this is really quite striking, number three, that suddenly they're allowed to be who they always were and they had suppressed that part of themselves. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. I, 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 I think sometimes I would agree with that, and sometimes you almost have to rein them back a little bit because they they can really get such a sense of yes, this is real that I now understand, and they want, and you have to say, oh, hold back, hold back. You still have to do a little bit more research or something. Um, I was doing some work with some young people that were all studying law degrees. And they, um, we looked at what the, the different types were within the group, uh, and it was fascinating that the, the you probably aren't surprised with the NF preferences. When we looked at what kind of law were you hoping to go into, the NF preferences were, were nearly all interested in human rights, um, um, get, get environmental causes, and things like that. They really wanted to use the, the, the core of the um, NF uh, temperament. And then some of the other groups were able to identify with some of the core drives of, uh, based on their temperament. Um, so I, I, I think it's, it's br brilliant as a, as a way to validate that. To, to, and I, I know Jerry mentioned, uh, there's a, I've, I've seen other research um, around in terms of the happiness and finding meaning and purpose in life comes up over and over again as being crucial. Um, and type certainly allows us uh, to do that. I think Paul, I can see Paul's hand is raised. So over to you, Paul. Okay, this is a personal story um, of my burnout on my, in, in my own case where I I, I, I burned myself out on the job really badly. <laughs> and um, so I've experienced all five of these, of these things. And it's almost like um, burnout uh, was a form of ego dissolution. And, um, and it wasn't a great, great uh, thing to go through, but uh, you know, it's sort of, um, I, f I feel like I've, I'm in a better place now with my life than, and before I don't recommend it, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that my justification to share this with a lot of the 
people I work with, especially young people, is I'd rather you say this without having to have the, the traumatic experience. Let's get to the questions straight away without having to, uh, to do that. Uh, and one of the examples I use is um, the, you know, so the Terminal Velocity Club. This, this is people who do parachute jumps and they survive even though their parachute doesn't work. Um, so that's, you know, and they, 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 ex, they, they reach terminal velocity, think they're going to die, and then they usually think <laughs> these five questions. And that's quite dramatic. And I did interview one man who was a member of the Terminal Velocity Club, and he was lucky because he landed somewhere soft. Um, he landed in some trees. Apparently, that's the best thing to land in. Uh, not that you have much choice if it does ever happen to you. Um, and he, uh, that, that was his experience. And I I'd interviewed him a year after he'd recovered from the injuries. His, his bones had just about um, recovered. And, but, and he, he had some, some, still some health problems related to it. But he was then ready to, to act. He really wanted to answer these questions, these five questions and make, make a change. But I, 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 ideally, I don't think we should have to go through a traumatic experience. We, sh we should be able to um, get straight in and with our clients, help them focus on these important questions. And use, we can use type as well as other, other things. I'm, I think we, we have type, but we, most of us have other models and approaches as well that we can uh, use. Okay, has anyone else got hands up? Any further comments? Right, Catherine, stuff, stuff out. Yeah, the, I mean, this uh, is not this is not rocket science or anything that you won't all have heard before. But I mean, I just always remember the time I first took the MBTI a long time, about thirty years ago, and it was just that profound relief. Oh God, it's okay to be who I am, particularly as an INTP woman. Um, and, and the other comment I would make on, on, well, type and in particular interaction styles, that difference in interaction styles between the directing preference and the informing explains to me a lot of difficulties that my husband and I had. So in communication. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah, so, I, and obviously you can do the same with sensing and intuition and whatever, but I just think I, I, that's why I've been in back so many years. I love type because it helps you live a better life. And, well, it helps you get on with other people better, et cetera. So yeah, not, not rocket science, but those are my yeah. things. Yeah, uh, yeah, I sort of described them there as the aha moment. The, I mean, we say that with clients, don't we? It's, we, we have it ourselves, um, you, you know, usually at some point. And then we also say it uh, regularly. I'm, 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 sometimes I'm lucky enough to, to, to um, introduce type to large groups of young people and you, you, some of the aha moments are absolutely fantastic they, they, they re-evaluate relationships they have within people who are important to them um, and it's just absolutely uh, fantastic okay Right. Thank you for all those comments. I think we'll. Um, what I want to do now is just is to share some of the ways um, I try to introduce the, these ideas to young people, it, you know, with some subtlety. So that's what I would like to share with you. Um, over the past couple of years, when lockdown first happened, I did a lot of. Um, I moved from working in schools and in person to doing everything on Zoom and online. And at first this was young people were having to access learning from home. Um, and then later it was, they were accessing the learning from, um, from, from classrooms. So they were back in bubbles in schools. One of the nice comments I had was when, when, when young people were accessing this from home, some teachers who said they had positive comments from parents who would be standing behind the child as I was talking to them about personality preferences and the parents were finding it useful too. So I was encouraged by that. And 
we some of the work that I, I wanted to do with young people was to get them to think about how how things were changing for them and how, what they might need to focus on. So that and this this slide here that you can see is based on when I work with adults and I've asked them one of the questions one of the activities I usually do with them is what advice would you send back to your 13 or 14 year old self to make sure that you made the most of your teenage years and I've so I've built up quite a, a large number of those and I say to them and this I, I intend to use this with with those young people when I take this into school and so you can hopefully you can see on the slide here what what advice people who share your preferences what they tend to say in common so I, if I for example I know we've got Sarah who happens to be I in the model I use I give um, each type as an animal um, and Panda happens to be the ESFJ. That is coincidence, Sarah. I'm not, I know you are real. Um, the advice that um, pandas or ESFJs tend to send back are to say what's really on your mind. Sometimes your politeness needs to have limits. Uh, don't look after everyone else and forget your own needs. The, the, these are some of the key bits of advice that ASFG, ASFGs tend to say would have helped them navigate their teenage years better. I don't know whether you would, uh, you could comment on that, Sarah, whether you, whether that sounds reasonable as advice that you would have sent back to yourself. Absolutely, absolutely. And I would, um really kind of recognize that through different stages of my life as well so different almost kind of different identities that you have at, at different stages in your life um so finding a way to say something and I, I I do you know now if I've got to deliver something which is um is maybe slightly tough feedback um I work I work I can still have to work hard at not being so polite about it that actually the it's not delivered at all you know you have a conversation you think right I've said it and then the person goes away and you haven't said it <laughs> mm -hmm. so um and I I need to continue to work on that um but I think I'm better at it now than I used to be <laughs> yeah yeah, and I, uh, often the teachers in the group, they will share, they, they will usually say, yes, that sounds relevant. And then it's quite nice because we can, I can ask, how have you learned to do that? And they've usually got some ideas and strategies that they can then share. So it is something we can improve on. And one of the things I like to do with this uh, as an activity is link it to risk taking behaviour. And the research I read on risk taking, we uh, saw research where types were ranked on risk taking behavior. And towards the top, two of the um, ENTP and ESTP were both towards the top of the risk takers. So I do remember some of the other people who have identified as those types to come down to the front and I give them a suite uh, and then say to them that. The, 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 there's a joke shop near where I live and they sell vomit sweets and there's I mix them up in a bag and there's a one in four chance that the sweet you have is a vomit sweet um would you dare eat this sweet in front of your peers and what we predict is that the ANTP and the ASTP absolutely will sometimes they can't eat it quick enough um, and the, they're, they're, they want to eat it even more if they think there's a chance that it's a vomit sweet, because these are the risk takers. These are the young people that are easily influenced by their peers. Equally, they're the two groups of young people that are usually the ones that get into trouble in school. And it, it, it always surprises, you know, it doesn't surprise me, but when I'm asked to go and work with the, um, the nurture group, the group of children that uh, are put in a porter cabin of half a mile away from the main school building as a group of children that teachers can't cope with, 
Um, and it goes to some of David Casey's research as well about they might be labeled as having ADHD because they're, they're, they're hard work. The traditional approaches might not work with them. And when I work with those groups, usually two, or two thirds to three quarters of that group of young people are those two types, ESTP, ENTP. And, what, and probably the worst thing you can do with those young people is to put them all in one classroom together and expect them to sit quietly and get on with, it, with work. So when we look at risk taking behavior, I have them at the front with this suite um, decide, you know, usually that they're going to eat it. And I can look them in the eye and do some of that post-traumatic stress thing with them and say, look at the advice that people you're you would send back to yourself. And I can say, truthfully, when I work with ASTP and ENT people in their 30s, they're often very successful. Uh, Risks, they describe the risks they've taken to be successful. They, they're often go-getters and they often report that they're happier in their 20s and 30s than, than when they're in their teens because they, they have more control of, in their life. And they usually, this resonates with the young people. And then I can say to them, but beware that some of them, they take one risk too many and they tell me this and they, they bring harm to themselves and to people who are important to them in their lives. And I really do like to look at them in the eye when I say that to them, because for many of them, it really does resonate. And we can ask them to think about uh, the advice, which would be to choose, choose your battles carefully. Don't, you don't have to argue with everybody all of the time. Um, especially those in authority. <laughs> uh, and um, so I think this is, the, the, this is some of the ways I used to try and bring what I've shared with you um, up till now to try and make, make it relevant to um, the people that we work with through examples and, and um, fr frames like this of what advice they might send them back to themselves from the future. And I think that's quite nice because it's not then myself as the adult figure giving, telling them what they should think or do. It, we're, we're framing it in such a way that they can really have a think about who they are and what impact is their behaviour, the choices of behaviour they make, the, often their type preferences are going to drive a lot of that unconsciously. Um, what impact that has on them, positive and negative. Equally, we can um, the koalas and the C, sorry, the ISFJ and the INFJ, they're the least risk takers. So for them, the advice is almost the opposite. And if I get them down to and give them a one in four chance of a vomit suite, they don't even want to touch the suite. They, they really want to have nothing to do with it at all. Uh, and so we can suggest to them that perhaps the, the challenges that they might face in their teenage years might be different challenges. It might be they do have to believe in themselves more. They do have to take credit for their, for their strengths and their good ideas. Um, and they usually uh, agree with that. And if I'm working with, it, um, uh, and there are often a number of teachers that will be those types that can then share some of the strategies they've developed. Okay. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that. Um, so see if I can see any hands go up. Right. Yeah, is that, a, a, can I see a hand? Can you see Mark, anyone? Marky and I, this is Catherine, but Marky's also got her hand up. All right, well, I'll just, I'll just first, yeah, Catherine, then. Just make my, I think this exercise, you know, writing a letter, um, advice from your future self, I think we should all do that every five years. <laughs> yes, I, and, I, and I know there is good research around that, isn't there, that it works, um, and journaling, how, how powerful that can be. And the types that tend to do that, when I ask young people, um, who does that anyway? Usually the people with five year plans are ESTJ, which is no surprise to why they tend to be so, get so much done. I'm sure that's not a coincidence. So did Marky also have a hand raised? If, if you did, then 
Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. I love this, love this um, piece that you did on this chart. And I just wanted to say, I wanted to say earlier, but I was, I couldn't unmute, um, was that, you know, being, I'm a step parent of two um, boys, ESFP and INTJ. And I would say that learning type and knowing kind of these dynamics and some of the ways that they were natural to them, first of all, helped me be a better parent in general. But help me really understand like that they had a natural course and it was their course was perfectly natural and fine and and healthy for them. <clears throat> and it really made a difference in our ability to support them to be the you know, the people they are now, which seems to be they're fairly well adjusted. They've got their issues, but you know, who doesn't? And it's really fun to see how type can really when you un unleash that unlock that um, you know, the supposed to and the expectations and just say, like, this is natural for you. Embrace it. And particularly with ESFP, helping him understand that the risk taking could get him into trouble and how to moderate that. He happens to be a firefighter now, and it's really lovely to see. He's incredibly careful and he's a firefighter. Yeah, th thank you for that, Marky. Uh, yeah, and I think that's why um, you know, those five questions around post-traumatic growth, these are the important questions of life and, and being wanting to be a, the best parent we can be is 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 such an important part of that. Um, it just reminded me of one young person, actually, how, you know, when I talked about the power of words, um, one young person had, uh, I, I'd given a description, um, I, I, I give children my own, you know, descriptions of their personality type uh, to try and ensure it's positive as well as useful. Um, but, um, and for ISFP, I put something about their ability to take risks and maybe not revise topics um, fully. They might just say, oh, I'll just do half of it and I might get lucky. More, the sort of the gamble and the SP sort of that, that, that side of things. And the one young person read that and then came up to me and he, he basically he'd been caught cheating in an exam and he was getting such a hard time from the, the staff at school. They were really finding it hard to forgive him for this you know, terrible mistake that he made. Um, and when he read that, it gave him such a lot of uh, solace and he could start to rationalize that so he could forgive himself. And I, and I thought that was absolutely brilliant. I, I was so happy that, and I could see it in his face. It, it's, it's something had changed in, for him, something positive had happened. And I just hope the teachers who were supposed to be the adults <laughs> uh, in the room, that they could forgive him too. So, and I, that's why I do like to work with teachers as well, to try and make them a bit more forgiving um, of different personality types. Okay, I'm conscious of time, but I might maybe try and get one more slide in. So some other work that I did, I'll share this because I think um, I've, I've really enjoyed sharing this, the, 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 work, the content based on this slide here. When I work, with, so during lockdown, stress, the stress levels go up, the mental health deteriorates of young people. We've heard a lot about that. There's been a lot of research around that. And one of the uh, model that one of the approaches that I found helped young people very well was was what's on this slide. Um, so this is based on temperaments. And what I noticed a lot of young people were doing was when they were in lockdown and be feeling stressed, it sort of moved them the way I described this, and I'm sure there are other mod other ways, but I'll share what worked for me. I described that the strengths that we have when we were under stress, we moved away from those and forgot what our strengths were. And that when we, um, so what we need to do is to go back and revisit the strengths of our personality preferences. And on this slide, I show it as the four temperaments because it's easier to show, but there are more detailed descriptions. And I found that young people really like this. They, they, this resonated. So for example, the SJs, they thought, oh yes, it, it, my strengths are hardworking, focused, determined, diligence. Um, and I need to get back 
to those the, the strengths. And the way I'd wrap this up for young people was go back and really remind yourself of what your core strengths are as a person so that you can you can take care of yourself and your own mental well-being. But also when you go back to get in, when you do get back into school, because a lot of young people, I've been working with some young people in year nine. So really this should be their third year of school. And they've in the UK, they've basically not had any time in school until this year. They've, they've not visited some parts of the school that they should have been there for three years. Um, so I use this as a way to say, not just look at your own strengths, but check in with the strengths that your friends and peers have, that you, the other people in your class, because and they you can they can use their strengths not just to help themselves, but to help you, and you can use your strengths to help your peers. And the, and and again, the feedback I've had on that has been very useful as a way. It's almost, I don't know, it's not tricking people in a, a bad way, but it's almost just getting them to reframe positive ways that they can start to use type for themselves, but for, for those around them as well. Okay, I'm conscious of time, so um, I don't know if any, anyone wants to, has any thoughts or can, comments on that. Okay, I'll take that as a no. Um, what I'll do is I'll start to wrap up, I think. So the uh, as we sort of found out at the beginning, it, it, it was person, the people who um, have a serious um, change in their health, so sort of paralyzed from the waist down, so tend to be um, more likely to have, because they've gone, more likely to have experienced post-traumatic growth. People who win the lottery, the research I've read suggests that um, there's an after you win the lottery, there's an initial um, increase in happiness, but that then tails away, and that we return after a year, we return to the level of happiness we had before they'd won the lottery. So if you're a miserable so-and-so before you win the lottery, a year later, you'll also be a miserable so-and-so. And if you are, you know. And if you were happy before, you'd be happy a year later. Um, so what keeps us returning to that, equili uh, um, that equilibrium, that status quo, that negative self-talk and negative bias, is we have to ask these serious, important questions. So um, that's what we've covered. I hope I've covered some of those with you. Um, and I'll just finish with, with this, because we could ask, is type real? And sometimes I think it's best not to start to get into that and just ask, is it useful? Is it helping the people? Does it help me? Does it help us? And does it help the people we work with? And I keep getting such, the answer is uh, definitely yes, for most of the time. Sometimes it's no, but the majority of the time, it's a definite yes. So that's what keeps me going with type. And I hope, I'm sure that's what keeps you going with type as well. Okay, I'm going to wrap up now, Sarah, and say, um, you know, just thank everybody for coming along and contributing as well to this. And the slides will be available. So if you wanted to have a look at those uh, questions um, and tr try them on yourself, your friends, your family, or your clients, then please feel free to do that. Okay, so thank you, David, so much. And the, the recording of this session will be up on the conference website with the um, with the slides, as David has said, um, within the next kind of 12, 12, 14 hours. So thank you very much indeed. I, that has just been fantastic, David. And I will stop the recording now.